Hi, everyone, and welcome to Heal Endometriosis Naturally with Wendy K. Laidlaw. Wendy has spent the last two years helping women with various stages of endometriosis to heal naturally after putting her condition into remission. After her own healing success from stage four endometriosis and adenomyosis, she's inspired to heal others, and her goal is to help some of the 175 million women know that there is another way other than painkillers, drugs, or surgery. This is the place to be for real talk with real people for real results so you can learn how to heal your endometriosis naturally. Please note that the opinions expressed in this program may represent options but are not a substitute for proper medical care. Before starting any new healthcare program, we recommend you consult with a health professional. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's, and we are still in the feel it section, which I know is everybody's favorite section, is the section that everybody just doesn't want to think about and doesn't want to feel, which is why we're doing it at the very beginning. Those sections we've been really struggling with, like the core elements like journaling and meditation and self dates and things like that, then it's probably because there's a very frightened inner part um, that's that's residing inside. And therefore, there's a lot of conflict on, on trying to Uh, control and maintain and sustain any thoughts and feelings that could break this um over the years I I think again I'll refer back to my own journey over the years I developed this uh, perfectly polished veneer to protect myself my veneer was my business suit and my briefcase and my career and my job and 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 etc etc and obviously inside, I was so detached from actually what was going on inside. I mean, I say detached, subconsciously I was, because I was very sensitive to, to the external stimuli, uh, to people, places and things. I could walk into a room and just immediately know when a couple had had an argument or when a woman was feeling sad. Or I would just pick up all these things. But obviously, as a woman with endometriosis, if you've had it for, for like 20, 30 years, what you learn to do is you learn to switch off from the the stimulation and that in itself can bring its own problems so even people who aren't as sensitive as us and i talk about we're e-hisps or exquisitely highly intuitive sensitive people like we are on a whole different level uh, of sensitivity so if we haven't been comfortable with that degree of sensitivity then what we do naturally by default is try and separate from that and we create this uh, divide from, from the core of who we are. And if you think when we're born, now whether we're born that way or made that way, nature or nurture, it, it, it's kind of really irrelevant. The fact is, is that is how we are. So therefore, once we recognize that and can accept that and almost respect it and admire it, then, then that gives us choices as to how we respond to how we are. And this is where... Um, why the, my programs have been strategically, lovingly and carefully designed to allow um, the safe connection to perhaps the, the parts that feel needed the, the biggest protection. Now, most people, in fact, I heard this, this uh, statement the other day from somebody who, who works with, um, who's a psychologist, and uh, she says, every single person alive did not get their needs met growing up. And I thought, wow, that was such a big statement because almost there's a, um, a feeling of shame or almost guilt for thinking that you have needs that weren't met. Or um, I think it was uh, one of the authors I've been reading. In fact, I think her name is here. Uh, Alice Miller is a very famous psychologist. And this book, The Drama of the Grifted Child is very interesting because it questions things like why um from a you know the the testament's perspective you know in in religion why do they say honor thy mother and father why don't they say honor the child which i thought was a very interesting question um and i and i guess while we're on this journey and we're we're exploring ourselves because this is why disease or disharmony is shown up in our body and it's reached a point where we're like okay we can't keep doing what we did before because it's not serving us it's not it's not healing us it's not helping us then we have to kind of gently ask the questions and um, I interviewed a um, a fantastic uh, chap yesterday for my podcast which will be and, and he was saying the same thing it's the questions we ask ourselves so and, and to do so in, in a loving nurturing and, and curious way that is what opens up all these different elements of us physically emotionally spiritually um, and that's kind of what, what we're doing with um, 
by, by this point of the feel it, invariably the idea of feeling it feels weak. That idea of feeling anything feels kind of like we should dismiss it because that's how we learned to survive in a very overstimulating world. There's actually a very toxic world. I had a conversation with somebody earlier and they were saying how they'd witnessed this um, very tall gentleman going into a pharmacy and raging at this poor pharmacist girl behind the counter. And he, ra he threw down his basket and he raged at her and, and he was a very overtly very angry man. Now that would be very unsettling for anybody's nervous system because you can see it and, it, and it's very clear. But there, my grandpa used to say, there, there are none so strange as folk. And there's a wide range, i.e. there's lots of strange folk out there. And um, and what, what I mean by that is, you know, there are a lot of people out in our environment, a lot of people out in our society, in our workplace, uh, in our family even, who are maybe very angry inside and project that anger out onto us, you, me, anyone round about them, anyone really like that angry man. But some people learn to kind of mask it and shove it down. Now, anger is a very interesting emotion, as you know, and we all have feelings of anger. There is no shame in that. The shame comes when we project it onto other people and we don't own it. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the feeling of anger is tends to be shied away from and feared and revered because, again, you see people uh, be overtly angry and you make a statement yourself, well, I'm never going to be behave like that. There's nothing wrong in being angry, upset, disappointed, hurt. These are all very important emotions. So if you remember the, the emotional kaleidoscope, it's very important to kind of keep increasing your awareness of what feelings you're having. And this, of course, is where the journaling comes in. But if we're going to head back to um, what I was saying a minute ago about um what prevents, I think you've got to look at what's preventing us from feeling and then how to learn how to feel. And, th and this is this is the, the, the psychology and the essence behind it. If we can become um, curious and accepting of the fact that there's a reason why we de develop those um, default mechanisms, then that then opens up other doorways into kind of curiosity and just noticing and being mindful of what steps that we can do very slowly, very carefully that can support us in our growth. Because I think um, I know on my own journey, I went on the, the conventional route and, and brain, body, everything. And um, I thought that's just what you had to do. And they would fix me like a, like a dysfunctional sort of um, machine that comes off the conveyor belt. I thought I just needed a bit of tweaking, a bit of twinking, and I'd be, I'd be fine and off my way. If only it was that simple. It's not that simple. At the same time, it is that simple. That's the oxymoron. We overcomplicate it because at the core of, of what we are is our vulnerable little child. Now, um, I, I can accept that there'll be some people that will be a little bit resistant to the idea of an inner child, but probably because you've the inner child within you, you've switched off from because you had to for survival, you had to for safety, you had to, you know, wrap her up in cotton wool and keep her down in the shadows because it wasn't safe for her to express herself. It's been really interesting. Again, there's a, um, a common theme that that is uh, occurs with uh, with all of us um, is that we we truly didn't get our emotional needs met as we we're growing up. <clears throat> and even even uh, more to that, we didn't get our spiritual needs met. I, you know, I'm not even talking, you know, uh, religious or anything like that. I'm talking from if if you look at a puppy, which I can't remember what puppy on last week or not, you can feel her spirit her spirit her spirit is is like evervescent it's sparkling it's uh, she, she's vibrant she's she's got no fear and what's really interesting is observing her um i did bring her on last week didn't i because i've talked about conditioning um is observing her uh being fearful and how i respond to her uh, I, I know with my own children because i didn't get any of my needs met growing up uh, apart from the very basic functional ones um i literally was at pains I read then and I remember reading the power of positive parenting at this particular point and recognizing uh, I didn't have all the words and the language for everything but I knew in, in, I knew intuitively that my upbringing had been dysfunctional I kind of recognized it. I didn't realize to the degree that it was so therefore I needed to learn other ways I had to be curious and mindful um, of other ways of interacting with my children so that they wouldn't end up with the same um issues concerns fears anxieties that that i had at that particular time so uh, by, by reading things like the power of positive parenting it actually opened up to 
how negative the parenting was that I'd got, how uh, critical, judgmental, attacking, uh, destroying all the spirit that it was. And, and the spirit it can be a very strong element to a human. And I believe that every woman that comes through my programs has this innate fighting spirit in them that they're just never, ever going to give up, which I just dearly love. And that's why I love working with you all, because you have that strength and you have that power. It's just at the same time, on the flip side, it's like the yin and yang. You also have that vulnerability and you also have to have that degree of sensitivity, which when you can learn to merge the two together, then you don't have the same amount of attention and the same amount of conflict in your body. So this is where when I talk about the spirit, I'm talking about the spirit being worn down and um, being bludgeoned and being attacked and being criticized and, and leaving, whether it's a baby or a toddler or a young child, confused and not feeling safe. Now, we know before the ages of two, um, every baby and child, um, basically, it's it's a sensory organism. So it is it's it's way of perceiving uh, where the breast is for, for milk or perceiving what is safe, i.e. for crying out or not crying out, is all done sensorily. So it's done from, from picking up the, the, the eye contact or for the smells or, or for, the, for, the, for the feelings that are there. So, so this is why we're, we're doing feelings. Feelings are at the core, along with the inner child, of what we're doing in this particular section. And um, it literally is the search for your true self because you were born with this beautiful spirit, with this lovely soul and energy, with this innocence. Um, I remember my, my son's headmaster in primary school saying uh, uh, one of these um, parents' conferences and, and I was really struck by it. And I can, see exact, I can still remember exactly where I was standing and when he said it. And he said, because he did from sort of P1 up to, I think it was P5 or something. And he said, this is the most treasured time of their life. They are innocent. These little children are innocent. They know not what is ahead. They know not all the toxicity that's out there. And I'm doing everything I can to preserve that for as long as I can. And it kind of gave me goosebumps because I thought, oh, wow, not only did he truly care for these kids, I'd never had that kind of care. And a lot of us didn't get it. And as I always say, we're, we're not here to bash our parents. Okay, we just make the assumption that you know they were perfectly imperfect and and they did the best they did some like some of my parents were outwardly um I, I always remember my counselor my therapist saying to me you really should have been taken into care when you were younger because you were so mistreated but i, I didn't know any different so i just i knew i had the strong spirit and i knew that i had to uh, adapt it's adapt or die mentality. And I think with a lot of us, we've had to learn to adapt our bodies to an environment which hasn't felt safe. So what we're doing on this particular journey is uh, becoming curious as to kind of what, acknowledging that there's parts of us that still need more information. And it's therefore asking the questions, what more information do we need from ourselves? Because this is the key. This is, this is what makes this different from anything else out there is allowing yourself to connect to yourself so that the, the the relationship that you have with yourself is not fragmented, is not disjointed and is not reliant on external people to fill you up or to give you answers because you know your body and your brain and your feelings and your emotions and your spirit and your soul more than anybody. But the irony is, is nobody taught us how to a recognize that we had these elements and these qualities to us and nobody told us how to interpret the information so what would have happened is we would have just switched off because that's the easiest thing to do as i say i look at my puppy and you know i i, I make the time like i did with my children i used to consciously think i have to you know when there was a situation i remember my son going to get um his inoculations and things and i for about 10 days before I explained that like, in 10 days time, this is what's going to happen. This is what it might feel like. This is what you might be thinking. This is what might happen in, in your body. And this blah, blah. And I, I literally took the time because I felt it was important to soothe him, calm him. By the time we went to the nurses for him to get his inoculations, um, they'd said that Sebastian was the only child and there had been 15 that day that had been told what was happening. The rest had just brought the children along and without warning had jagged a needle in their arm. So you can imagine what that would do to a child, the, the sense of trust, the sense of, of safety, the sense of, of, of shock and surprise. So that's just one incident. So we've got to make an assumption 
that there are parts of us that are still feeling frightened and scared to feel feelings. So this is where we respect that absolutely categorically, but we also have to support that as well. So once we become aware of it, we have to support it. We have to get everything out of our body and out of our head and out of our brain onto paper, not only to, to track the journey and to so that we can look back and read because we think we'll never forget, but we do. Our minds play tricks on us all the time. Um, and in fact, I went back through my journals um, last weekend and, um, it, and that was like, when was that 2017 18 and 19 and this year and box them all up um and i i had forgotten so much stuff but equally it was incredible to to notice my own whilst physically i've been you know completely healthy and, and the condition's been in remission I, I think almost six years now emotionally i was able to see how i'd grown and and this is what's very important to me as part of this program is to recognize the emotional growth as well as the spiritual growth because um, that's an essential part of who you are. So how do you do that in a way that's very supportive? Well, A, you, you'll recognize you probably have a very strong critic, a very strong protector. Uh, they could be the same, they could be separate, they could be a very critical parent in there. And what we're looking to do is to keep um, noticing what's coming up for us in our dialogue. We always have a dialogue going on in our head, always. As soon as we wake up, it's on. And what you're looking to do is to retrain your brain to manage your mind if we can manage our mind as and become aware of what's what is repetitive in the background it's like when you go into these uh, go into these shopping malls and into these shops and there's just this background sort of music on all the time now sometimes that can be going on in our head if we don't increase our awareness of it so as you know my, one of my many sayings is a i e i e awareness information education inspiration then comes empowerment so how do we increase our awareness through the writing and through the meditation and through the, those tools it allows this communication of um, transmitting and receiving what's going on internally now if you've been switched off to your inner child in particular that that there's a lot of distrust that that will be going on within yourself your inner child probably has tried to come out and express itself before and our and our perfectionist and and a people pleaser and, and pusher and all those parts that are very strong parts have said no stop being a wuss stop being pathetic stop being weak and and kind of bludgeoned ourselves that younger those vulnerable parts down into into silence again so when we start to do this and this is a very important part of the journey i, I really can't stress this enough recovery of the of the inner child really starting to connect to your inner child really really starts to make a big difference to how you feel emotionally spiritually and of course physically so now all these concepts took me a wee while to get my head around because i was incredibly stubborn incredibly kind of like uh, philosophical and um and very practical kind of like yep i get this and i get that and i just need to do this need to do that and it must be this the 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 emotional psychological and, and almost spiritual side of the parts of me that were that were disowned if you like that took me a long time to kind of really embrace embrace was a bit further up the line even to accept that this was actually going on inside me and this isn't woo woo this is factual and you'll know yourself like your inner child will show up if in particular with authority figures authority figures who are revered by society or in a white coat or in a, a in a, in a uniform or something like that that you can really feel like be a good girl don't make a mistake you know don't do anything wrong all that kind of stuff but what we're looking to do is to connect your child in a way that if it's been wounded if it's been abused if it's been um hurt if it's been so invariably our inner child has been deeply wounded and again I just need to look at my puppy and and she gets you know if I if I get grumpy at her she she looks like I've I beat her to, to you know to, to a pulp and I've just been a bit, bit grumpy with her um, and I've told her off um, so you can imagine like the, the hurt that's being stored inside your body, in your nervous system. And th this is not woo woo stuff. This is like factual stuff, you, you know, with all the MRI brain scans and things now that are available, you can tell the chemical reactions that occur in the body. Again, a lot of this is subconscious, midbrain and reptilian brain. So what we're doing by addressing um, these particular elements is um, by slowly carefully, lovingly, and gently 
try and connect to the to the true self which has so much wisdom and so much strength and so much guidance and it's bringing that to um bringing that up slowly to the core uh, up from the core to, to the surface can really um surprise you and and probably make you grieve a little bit as well and probably make you sad and probably make you feel a bit down and a bit depressed and a bit mournful because so when you start to to pay attention when you start to feel the feelings that's okay i think that's really important to say I want you to feel the feelings so that you can move through the feelings. I don't want, I don't like that people feel sad or down or depressed. At the same time, it's completely unrealistic to expect to be happy all the time. And that is a defined happiness is to learn to try and put words to feeling states so that you can improve the relationship with what's happening. Because when you're little, again, I, I remember with my own children, you know, uh, guiding them and supporting them and saying, oh, so how do you feel? And they go, I don't know. And say, so so if somebody hurt you or somebody bullied you, would you feel hurt or upset? So again, it's just looking at the words and the language as an adult to help that, that, that inner, more vulnerable part of you come to the fore. Because if you don't deal or you don't connect with that particular part, it's going to, it's going to stay in hiding and it's going to deprive you of tremendous joy it, it's not it's not normal to be happy all the time it's an impossible state we are living beings that are influenced by everything and and everyone that's around us what we learn as we continue to move through this program is to find peace is to find joy is to find tranquility is, is to define different um, elements of what I refer to under the happiness banner. And sometimes these things can be fleeting and sometimes these things can last half an hour or half, a, half a, uh, an hour and a half or half a day or a day. But again, because we are continually um, you know, evolving and changing and affected by what's going on around about us, I say it's not realistic to, to expect to be happy in inverted commas all the time. Equally, by now, hopefully you've learned who is toxic in your life because people can have incredible toxicity that can have these kind of attacking, damning projections onto you as well. So again, it's noticing through the journaling and the meditation. The journaling by now, of course, is, is essential that you have this as, as, as you breathe the air and you drink water and you eat food to survive. This is an essential way to allow you to connect with all these younger parts. So, um, and I say this, considering creating not only a, an internal nurturing parent. And this was something I, when I, because I've been rereading this book myself, I've, I've read it three times now and I love it. Every time I read it, it kind of makes me a little bit emotional because, oh my goodness, did I bludgeon my inner child to pieces. I was so hard on myself. I was, you know, uh, disconnected from myself. And, and, and I guess there's still a part of me that feels sad that I had to be so hard on myself. But then equally, I had no choice because that was my survival strategy. That was my survival technique. So, so in addition to this nurturing parent, believe it or not, I'd forgotten about this protective parent. And what I mean by that is like recognizing it's okay to protect yourself from other things or other people who might be trying. So I'd forgotten that, you know, um, on my journey, I'd forgotten that it's an essential part. You know, when you uh, care for something or care for something, you protect it, you look after it. And that's where, again, a lot of women with endometriosis don't know that it's okay to protect themselves. So we're looking to create this internal parent that can parent our parts, that can parent ourselves on a daily basis. Are we getting enough to drink? Are we getting enough to eat? Are we getting enough sleep? Are we getting outside into nature? These are just basic, basic things. And if you look at Maslow, the psychologist, the, the hierarchy of needs, we need these core basic foundations in so that we can build on these things and we can get uh, more self-awareness and then that whole self-actualization, which basically means you know, an increase in awareness that you can move forward and attain what you were supposed to, um, you know, what you're supposed to achieve in this world, which isn't being racked in pain and, and, and misery and distress. What we're looking to do is to um, trust that you have everything that you need within your brain, within your mind and within your body and within your spirit 
to get the answers to the questions that you have that can allow you to, to keep moving forward. And perhaps, as I say, my belief has always been that you've been through all of this so that, uh, you know, further up the road, that will um, be, uh, it's almost like you're in training for the future. This will be preparing you for your purpose further up the road. So what I'm going to suggest is that you uh, try to just be kind of playful, dare I say, be playful with the idea of this creation of an internal parent, number one. And then what, and, and imagine, I mean, I didn't have my own parents to pull from. I just imagined my own parents, uh, that my own ideal parents, because my own parents were not nurturing or protective in any way, shape or form. They were not fluffy and um, they were very, very prickly. So, and that's what I'd taken on and in I, with myself. The, the critic had, um, my internal critic had got to the point where I would just, um, I could never do anything right. It was never, uh, I say perfect enough. I, my perfectionist uh, used to show up quite a lot. Nothing wrong with those parts, by the way. My philosophy is these parts are there for a purpose and, and they did an amazing job. What we're looking to do now is to bring up the other parts of you, the other beautiful parts that are maybe currently in hiding and too scared to come up. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we increase our awareness of what is going on in our head. What is the dialogue? Is it helpful? Is it kind? Is it encouraging and compassionate? Or is it chastising? Um, is it catastrophizing? Is it, is it uh, ruminating? You know, it, do you know what I mean? If we don't train our brain to manage our mind, our mind can literally drive us to despair. So this is where we, when we first learn that actually we have that power, that's when it suddenly opens up a whole new doorway. Now, it doesn't mean to say that anything you felt in the past um, isn't isn't real because of course it's real um, does it mean that you know there's anything wrong with you as a person no it just means you're a human being that is a, a byproduct of the environment and the conditioning is it all nature and nurture thing it doesn't really matter fact is you know uh, you know you there's so many studies there's so many tests there's so many uh, brain scans there's so many um studies done on how people can rewire their brains now that is just a fact what we need to keep doing is recognizing that the brain body connection um i mean i still see a therapist now because um, i see it used to be once every second uh, two to three months just as, as, as a kind of cleaning up the cobwebs type thing because what i didn't want is to just stop and then go carry on and then maybe pick up as I see cobwebs and things again. But she'd said something very interesting to me. Firstly, from, my, from, from the outset, she was very accepting of who I was, where I was and what I wanted to do. And that, that was very validating to me, especially when I was beating myself up and, and I felt complete failure and inadequate and pain and, and disabled and everything else. So that was very validating. And the more that she was accepting of me, the more I could, you know, play around with the idea of maybe accepting myself that was a challenge for me to accept myself and then once I started to accept where I was at and just say well what is this teaching me what you know what is coming up in my journal what has come up in meditation how is my body feeling I started to ask different questions it was amazing what came up for me now one thing that she did say which was very interesting to things and that's what we're looking to um, become the detective increasingly of our feelings and emotions and what's happening inside. So the best way to do that is by very early embers of creating a nurturing internal parent. So we're, we're taking responsibility for our thoughts and our feelings, i.e. We're, we're taking responsibility by just noticing. It doesn't necessarily, we have to change them at the moment. I just want you to notice them. I want you to go, oh, that's interesting that I thought that. And then if you can stay with it and notice how it affects you in your body and where it affects you in your body, because all this is going to be strengthening you in many, many different ways. And then get involved and, and experiment with it and see what comes up because it might surprise you. And what might also surprise you is the feelings and emotions that come with it. Whatever comes up, you'll be able to handle. I have no doubt because you have the resources. If you're feeling resistance to doing I would write in your journal what's coming up for you and what do you need to feel reassured to do it? What is it that you, you, you can do to support yourself to, um, to really connect with, with that inner child? And, and this book as well is, is just lovely about the, the drama of the gifted child. I believe that 
every single one of you women that come through my program are very gifted indeed. And that has, you know, and you have a lot of light or you had a lot of light when you were born. That light was obviously very threatening to, um, to the people around about you at the time, or they didn't recognize it, they didn't nurture it, and they didn't, you know, encourage that beautiful light and that gift to grow. And this is, I guess, and there might be massive resistance to doing it. All those signs are good. But I want you to um, I, I promise that you'll you'll give it a good try. And but um, that is us. So I just want you to focus on the power of your uh, inner child. And and just even if you're very cynical about all this stuff, just notice it and go along with. Just trust the process. Trust that you have all the resources within you, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, to heal your body and to heal your heart because your heart will probably been very, very battered and bruised and also to heal your soul and, and, um, and, and obviously the, the emotional component as well. So, so that is us for this week. Okay. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening to Heal Endometriosis Naturally with Wendy K. Laidlaw. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and rate us. If you're interested in learning more, you can download your top five jumpstart tips at healendometriosisnaturally.com and jump on the VIP email list. Remember to keep you number one. The world needs a healthy you.